Hello, everybody, and welcome to Patrice and Ava. It's wonderful having you with us today. I'm very happy about this. Today is the fifth conversation on the conversation series on animal justice and animal politics. And it's entitled From Animal Voices to Animal Agoras. So as usual, and as uh, perhaps some of you already know, we will begin by having some introductory questions to situate our conversation and also to kind of learn some of the basic concepts we are going to touch on today. So we will begin with questions related to the political turn in animal ethics. What is the political turn for those of you who are unfamiliar with that about buying sanctuary and its politics? And also the notions of the title, the, this kind of two key notions on animal agora and animal voices. And then in the second part, we will have an open conversation based on three questions. The first one will be about the political agency of animals. We will then, then move to quest, the question about embodied political communication. And the question re more related to structural changes and how to move towards a zoo democracy or an animal democracy. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, let me introduce our three speakers today. Uh, Sue Donaldson is a co-convener of the Animal Politics in Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, the Apple Research Group, and a research associate in the Department of Philosophy, Queen's University, Canada. She is the author of numerous articles concerning animals and politics, and her books include Zoopolis, a political theory of animal rights with Oxford University Press, which is co-authored with Will Kimlicka. And she's also one of the authors of the book Chimpanzee Rights, the Philosopher's Brief with Routledge. Patrice Jones is an ecofeminist writer, educator and activist. She is the co-founder of Vine Sanctuary in Springfield, Vermont, an LGBTQ-run farmed animal sanctuary, and the author of numerous articles concerning animals, ecofeminism, and queer theory. Her publications include The Oxen at the Intersection with Lantern, the book chapter Eros and the Mechanisms of Eco-Defense in Carol J. Adams and Laurie Gruen's Ecofeminism, Feminist Intersections with Other Animals and the Earth with Bloom Bloomsbury, and Queer Eros in the Enchanted Forest, the Spirit of Stonewall as Sustainable Energy, which is an peer-reviewed article that was published in QED, a journal in uh, GLBTQ World Making. Finally, Ava Meyer is a philosopher and novelist. A Ava works as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam on the four-year research project, The Politics of Not Eating Animals, and is the chair of the Dutch study group for animal ethics. Recent publications include Animal Languages with John Murray, and I believe also with MIT Press. It was recently published as well with MIT Press. And When Animals Speak Towards an Interspecies Democracy with New York University Press. Ava also wrote 11 books, fiction and non-fiction, that have been translate, translated into 18 languages. I will ask two questions to each of our speakers now with the, in this first part that will be more introductory, as it were. So let me begin with Sue. So as one of the co-authors of Zoopolis, which is a book that you wrote with uh, Will Kimlicka, it's arguably the book that opened up the so-called political turn in animal ethics or animal rights theory. So because our conversation today is situated, I think, in great part in this space, in the political turn, I just wanted to begin by asking you whether you could explain to us a little bit about Zoopolis and also how did the political turn emerge? What are the central questions? What are the central concerns in the field? Because your work has played such a structural role in the field, I thought I should begin by asking you this question. <laughs> thank you, Pablo. And uh, thanks so much for organizing this conversation. I just want to say that um, in my experience, uh, Eva and Patrice are the two most perceptive uh, and insightful observers of animal and human animal relations that I know. They also both write eloquently about those relationships. And I've just learned so much from both of them. Uh, so it's a real treat today to, to have this conversation together. Uh, okay. Um, so a bit of context then about the, the political turn. Um, so just generally the, the field of animal political theory is primarily concerned with questions of power, 
of law and, and governance. So how human societies make collective decisions and collective choices that affect animals and how these are questions of justice. Um, I think it's actually helpful to distinguish maybe three aspects of the political turn. And so the first, I would say, uh, represented by authors like Rob Garner and uh, Alistair Cochran and Martha Nussbaum and Siobhan O'Sullivan and others, um, have argued that we must change existing social and governance institutions uh, to ensure that animals' rights and interests are taken into account in human decision making. Uh, so the key focus here is representation, how to change institutions of political representation to work on behalf of animals, to ensure that their interests are counted and their basic requirements uh, for flourishing are supported. Um, so there's a second strand, which I would call more the critical turn in um, animal political theory. And one focus uh, on this dimension is on how animals aren't just the recipients of human action, they aren't just passive victims of injustices, um, but also engage in active resistance uh, against human violence. Um, other critical theorists focus on the connections between the domination of animals uh, and other systemic forms of domination, such as race, gender, disability, colonialism and dispossession, uh, and so on. Uh, so I'm thinking here of theorists like Dinesh Wadiwal and Manisha Dekka, Claire Jean Kim, and, and, and many others. Um, so the third strand uh, of the political turn, of which... Um, I would say zoophilus is, is a part, um, is centered on the recognition that many animals are fully social, cultural, and political beings. So political animals, in other words. Um, and this raises the possibility of co-determination of humans and animals building better societies and better politics together, uh, engaging in shared creation and decision uh, in co-authorship of a shared society. Uh, so bringing animals into politics isn't just about representing animals and their objective needs, and it isn't just about resistance and domination uh, or the critique of domination. It's also about enabling animals as decision makers and recognizing them as members of political communities and creators of worlds. Um, and this is agency in its positive dimensions of, of self-determination and, and world making. And so the key question that uh, Will Kimlicka and I explore in Zoopolis is how to think about animals as members of different kinds of self-determining political communities. Uh, and in some cases, we believe it makes sense to think of animals as forming their own distinct political communities on their own territories. So think of orca pods off the uh, west coast of America uh, or mountain goat herds uh, in the Rockies. In other cases, it makes sense to think of animals as forming distinct political communities, but as part of a shared land base with humans, uh, the situation of many so-called uh, urban and rural wildlife or, or free living animals like squirrels and foxes and house sparrows and so on. And yet in other cases, as with domesticated animals like cows and chickens and dogs, uh, it makes sense to recognize domesticated animals, at least for now, uh, as sharing a society with humans. Currently, these animals are tyrannized by humans, but to end this tyranny requires more than determining their needs and interests and counting these fairly in human decision-making. It requires a much more profound transformation. Uh, for example, we shouldn't think of domesticated animals as the objects of human politics and decision-making. Rather, um, we should think of them as members of the people, uh, members of the self-determining polity that is organizing, coordinating, uh, and creating its collective life together. So politics is something we should do with animals, in other words, not to them. This requires some radical new ways of thinking about political agency and community. Uh, and Wills and my work draws particularly on feminist and disability theory for ideas of relational and distributed agency and on multicultural and indigenous political theory for new ways of thinking about the relationship of self-determination to territory or land. Um, but I should add, as, as I mentioned earlier, especially since our work on Zoopolis, uh, we have been significantly influenced by uh, and, uh, Ava's work on animals and political communication and by the example of the Vine community and, and Patrice's writing about it. 
fantastic, Sue. Thank you very much for this wonderful summary. I only wanted to, you, you already said this, but I wanted to kind of emphasize that this difference between the kind of point one that you mentioned and the third one, that what uh, authors like Alester Cochrane or Robert Farron and others would argue that the interests of animals should be uh, represented, we should take them into account. They do not think that animals should self-represent themselves, which is something that people in kind of point three, uh, yourself, um, Will and Eva, uh, think that that should happen. Animals should represent themselves. They have voices and therefore they should uh, be full participants of our democracies. Uh, it's just because I thought that you explained this, but they wanted kind of to emphasize that point. My, my second um, question relates to our the title of our conversation, actually, because in one part of the title for today's uh, conversation is inspired by your article, Animal Agora, Animal Citizens and the Democratic Challenge, which was uh, published uh, this in 2020. I just wanted to ask you, so because I think this is a very important notion, the notion of Animal Agora, and it's new in the field, really, until that article was published, we were not using that. Uh, terminology. So I was wondering whether you could explain a little bit what it means and also what does the idea of animal agora bring to the fore in comparison to zoopolis? How is it moving the discussion forward? Right, okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so since zoopolis, Will and I have been elaborating and, and refining some of the ideas um, and uh, uh, specifically trying to think more deeply about what it means for animals um, uh, to be political agents and members of political community and, and how we can enable that. Um, so the idea of the Agora relates specifically to the situation of domesticated animals uh, and what it would mean for them to be part of sort of we the people uh, with humans in sh a shared political community. Um, so the concept of the Agora, of course, goes back to uh, ancient Greek city-states uh, where political space was conceived as falling into two um, dimensions. So, so one was the official meeting space, the NICS, uh, in which formal uh, decisions were taken. Um, and then there was the broader civic space, the Agora or, or town square, if you will, um, in which a much broader and less structured form of politics uh, is able to unfold. So the idea is that formal politics depends on a much broader informal politics. And it's in this Agora space uh, where we learn about our co-citizens and what they want and need and what we can do together, uh, discovering and deliberating with one another uh, about matters of collective interest, either in words or in the process simply of doing things together, uh, establishing basic social norms for peaceably coordinating that, that community activity, despite our vast uh, uh, differences and different interests. So this requires public spaces in which citizens encounter one another, engage and respond to one another in ways that allow for the emergence of shared ideas, meanings, practices, um, and, and institutions. So I'm drawn to this idea of the Agora uh, as a way of doing politics with domesticated animals for a couple of key reasons. So one concerns the scale of politics and the nature of embodied participation. So it's very hard to imagine how domesticated animals can be direct participants in like formal national uh, or international political debates. Uh, animals can't encounter us in a virtual or abstract political space. Um, whereas the village, the town, uh, the city, these, these are a doable scale. Um, and a place where we can have face-to-face -face politics. So we need these physical spaces that are small enough to be familiar uh, to domesticated animals, but of sufficient size and complexity to enable embodied and emplaced communication, the development of mutual trust amongst diverse citizens, social learning, and importantly, the unfolding of creative activity together. So not just town squares, um, but all kinds of public spaces. And I guess the second uh, important dimension of the Agora is that this is the place of emergent and inclusive politics. So where ideas can be initiated, explored, uh, or proposed, uh, to use Ava's, Ava's language, uh, in these embodied and emplaced ways. Uh, so this is a space where no one need be excluded because they aren't a persuasive orator or an office holder or the spokesperson of a powerful interest group. Um, 
So that's sort of the idea of the, uh, the Agora and what it brings to the t- table. Um, I'm not saying that this is the only place or, or uh, for exploring a new kind of interspecies politics with domesticated animals, but I think it's uh, potentially a very fruitful one. This ties also, I, I read Animal Agora, their article, I think in 2020 or 2019, I don't remember. And one of the things that struck me was that when I went to Vine, I, th- I thought, oh, here it is. This is an agora. And in fact, you, an animal, an, an animal agora is the public commons, this notion of the public commons. You sort of equate them in the article because that's what it is. Buying uh, humans, actually, they, they have adopted this language. They refer to the commons now, which is also very interesting. And Patrice is going to tell us now uh, a little bit about this as well. So, Patrice, this fits perfectly with uh, what we are going to discuss now. You have I extensively written about buying and its queer feminist and multi-species ethos. Uh, Patrice, can you please explain what's Vine like? What is politically distinctive distinctive about Vine's and multi-species community? Because I know it's a dress actually in some respects. So if you could perhaps explain a little bit about Vine for those who are unfamiliar with it. Thank you. Um, Sure. Uh, So uh, Vine Sanctuary, which is located in in, uh, Vermont in the Northeastern United States uh, is an LGBTQ led uh, farmed animal sanctuary uh, that works for social and environmental justice as well as for animal liberation. Uh, More than 700 non-human animals uh, live at the sanctuary, uh, which uh, stretches over, um, oh, I always forget the number of hectares, uh, but it's 105 acres uh, in weird U.S. terms. It all began as a as a as a as a as a sanctuary uh, for for chickens uh, that Miriam Jones and I uh, co-founded accidentally um, in um, I'm just going to relocate my dear Lucky. Uh, this is that is Lucky who's been with us for a very long time. He's deaf now. It all began when Miriam Jones and I found a, a, a chicken um, in a ditch by the side of the road. Um, in rural Maryland um, in the year 2000. Uh, uh, We were, uh, this was in the middle of the part of the United States where factory farming of chickens was invented and perfected. Um, And through a series of happenstances, uh, we ended up founding what was initially a chicken sanctuary uh, surrounded literally uh, by factory farms in which tens of thousands of birds uh, were were held captive um, in the worst situations. Uh, and I, I mentioned the origins only because uh, when we decided, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to make it formal, uh, we're going to make this a sanctuary, we decided, you know, what our motto would be. And our motto was going to be, let birds be birds, um, meaning that chickens are birds uh, and that um, probably uh, their most, uh, what would be most important to them would be their relationships with each other, not with us. Um, and that uh, our job, protect them from other humans, um, and then, you know, circumstances in which they might um, become themselves, uh, uh, recover themselves, rewild themselves to the extent possible, um, and that while we would be um, super happy and super excited if they wanted to have relationships with us, uh, we wouldn't um, press for that in any way. Uh, and and that um, ethos uh you know, from 20 years ago, uh, still infuses vine today. Uh, although it's not just birds, it's also cows and uh, goats and, and sheep, and not just chickens among birds, but emus and turkeys and geese and ducks, etc. cetera. Um, uh, th- there is uh, one area of the sanctuary where it's mostly cows, although they spend a lot of time with wild turkeys and other um, non-free uh, living animals. Uh, uh, there's another part of the sanctuary that we call the valley, which is mostly birds. Um, and then there is this part of the sanctuary that we used to call by a very dull name, but we now call the commons, thanks to Sue, um, in which uh, uh, cows and goats and sheep and alpacas, one pig, hordes of chickens, ducks, geese, guinea fowl, three emus, uh, and others I'm, I'm sure that I've forgotten, um, negotiate a shared space, uh, co-creating um, a community. Um, if something about Vine is distinct, I would guess that it's um, 
the degree to which the sanctuary is really centered on this idea of self-determination um, and self-actualization um, and the degree to which um, uh, the non-human members of our community are thought of as community members rather than say passive recipients of care. Um, and, and the degree to which we recognize uh, that, that we are all co-creating um, this community together within the horrible circumstances uh, uh, set up by humans uh, doing whatever we can uh, within property relations and the violence of the state uh, to on, on the one hand, keep folks safe from other humans, um, but then within our area to, to, to do our best uh, to, to be a, a, a community. For people who might not know about Vine, we will write as well the website where there is plenty of information But Patrice has written on this in the auction and the, at the intersection. It's a fantastic book, especially in the introduction, you see there how Vine was formed. And also very interesting article, Quia Eros in the Enchanted Forest, the spirit of Stonewall as sustainable energy. Uh, we will write this in the, the afterwards in the description, but I think with this text and Vine's uh, website, one gets a pretty good sense of what's Vine, how it was formed. Um, one also learns about a um, very uh, interesting relationship between uh, two homosexual, I think it was Rooster or Tarkis, I can't remember, Jen Paul Ducks. and Jen Claude. Um, Ducks? Ducks. Ducks, yes, that's right, Ducks, correct. What I wanted to ask you next, Patrice, is that, as, as you know, and this is something that interests me immensely, the question of imagining better futures for humans and animals together in the same political multi-species community. And I believe that Vine can give us so much. It can help us a lot to imagine that future. And this is actually something that you told me uh, when I was at Vine, that one of the things that Vine could contribute to in more you know, academic terms, perhaps, or in this kind of but also socially and politically, is to imagine the, a future with animals, uh, how to do that, and to see that the practice of that doing as it were, which I did see at Vine uh, many times every day, pretty much. So, because you said this to me, Patrice, that uh, Vine can play an important role in, in imagining better futures for humans and animals, more just futures. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. I, I think I... I think that we tend to think about imagination as as something that just like happens in in our in our own heads, um, and there is that kind of imagination. And I think I think Vine uh, can play a role there. One thing that we've noticed um, is how frequently uh, people who have visited Vine um, uh, report um, that they end up dreaming about Vine, um, literally that Vine enters their actual dreams. Um, in ways that, you know, feel meaningful. Uh, and I, I don't think that's accidental, um, nor is it something that I can, you know, explain uh, in, in, in academic terms. But I, I think there is something about the process of, of building a multi-species community in all of its imperfections uh, that it awakens something some imagined part of oneself. Look, I still remember the first chicken we found by the side of the road. And the, the night that I spent, uh, we set her up. She turned out to be a he, but that's another story. Uh, but we set her up in, in, in a corner of the garage. And then I couldn't sleep all night um, worried about this chicken. Um, and the next morning, uh, I, 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 I imagined that it was sunrise long before the sun was actually up. There was just like the slightest little lightness in the sky. Um, and I, and I, I, I walked out to, to check on the chicken and then I found myself running. Um, and, and in my body, I could feel myself like a child running as hard as they can um, to check on this bird. Uh, and then the glee, the joy when the bird was okay. Um, and I think there's something there uh, that I was experiencing and that it's possible to experience uh, at Vine and other places, we're not the only, uh, where there's an awakening of the imagining self. Uh, and so that's the part in our, and I've, I've heard this from visitors. I've heard people have told me it means so much to me uh, 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 that, 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 that Vine lives in their imagination, even if they haven't ever been here. Um, 
uh, that moves me so much. Uh, but but there's another thing that's really important. And, and Sue started to get it when she said, uh, talked about, quote, doing things together. Because I, I think uh, for me and uh, for me, imagination is not just this thing that happens in my head, but imagination is also doing, like thinking with a pencil or, 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 or trial and erroring some, I'm moving my hands as if I were solving a problem. And, and that kind of imagining is imagining we, we can do together um, and should do together. Humans need to do it together a lot better. Um, and of course, then that is the kind of imagining it, that, that we can do uh, with other animals. Uh, and, 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 and so I think that's uh, the other way that, that, I, that I meant, is, is we're imagining together as we're co-creating this community together. Yes, it, it really speaks to me, what, everything that you said, Patrice. Thank you very much. So now, Ava, you've written two wonderful books, uh, apart from a lot of other texts, but one is called Animal Languages and the other one, When Animals Speak. And in, in those books and in your work, more generally, you've put the notion of animal voice at the center, uh, the idea that animals speak, which again, it relates a lot to some of the things Sue was saying between those that might think that animals cannot represent themselves and those that are trying to argue like yourself that they can because, for example, they have a voice, they can speak, they can tell us. Can you explain to us what constitutes that animal voice? What is the content of that? Because it's a very difficult term and kind of these ideas are, I think, quite complex. So we have to the, the experts on animal voice. So if you could please tell us about this. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you for bringing us together in this uh, conversation and for sharing it. And first, I would like to return the compliment to Sue, because uh, when I was writing my master's thesis in philosophy, I was very lucky to attend uh, a workshop uh, where um, uh, Sue was present uh, with Will Kimlicka actually speaking about Zoopolis. This was even before uh, uh, Zoopolis uh, came out. And I've been very lucky to be able to uh, read her work and sort of move, think, think alongside it and with it and against it sometimes. And uh, uh, also to have many personal conversations uh, about the things that we are uh, thinking about, um, in which stories about uh, animals play a very important part. And I think we're also trying to sort of express something um, through that and we're learning through that. So I'm very, uh, very lucky uh, to have Sue uh, as, as a um, person to, to speak with. Um, and uh, the same goes for Patrice's work. I think we've not met in person, but I'm very glad that this work is being done uh, at Fine. I have a paper coming out actually about sanctuaries in which I also refer uh, to your work and um, but we can later discuss that because I think we need these experiments, but that's sort of the end of my answer. So <laughs> maybe I should start at the beginning. Uh, and I think that the beginning for me is that um, I live in a world in which other animals speak. They speak, they have uh, communities, they have uh, cultures, they say things to each other and to us. And I've always been um, in conversation with, uh, and the conversation understood in a very broad sense, right? So it's not just speaking in words or using sounds or whatever, but it's really having a, an embodied dialogue over time uh, with these animal others. And when I was younger, these would include horses and cats and uh, dogs and guinea pigs. And uh, they are some of the people that taught me about life and many of the things that that I believe are valuable and many of, of the, the kind of bigger concepts that we usually associate with humans like friendship or love or whatever, you know, for me it's always been a multi-species endeavor and I've been very, um, I don't know, I, I often feel that I was raised by horses in some sense, you know, because they taught me certain things um, without words, but through um, uh, all the other ways in which we speak to each other. So that's kind of the... I think the basis from which my philosophical work about uh, animals and politics, animals and democracy, animals and language um, uh, arise. So it, it, there was first kind of the, uh, the, the experience. And um, uh, this was in very sharp contrast, um, <laughs> or is still, I suppose, in many ways, um, uh, with how many 
philosophers. Philosophers are very specific kind of animals because they have these um, all of these things that they think are true or necessary. Or um, uh, and then you have to prove things. You have to prove they are like this or like that and that can work well you know it's a language game that can be very productive um, but that should also be challenged and this is what we are doing now and animals are sometimes also stuck in their language games that can be either species specific or uh, multi-species or belonging to a certain community and we can create new language games anyway I, I, I entered the field of philosophy because I like to think in certain ways and I quite like to deal with concepts. Um, I think they're um, good material for, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, it can be a game, but it can also be very serious. Um, I wanted to know more about humans and other animals as well. I wanted to understand something about the ambiguities um, uh, that we experience in our societies in relation to the other animals but, uh, and other humans, all other others. Um, uh, so that was one of the reasons why I, I came into philosophy and then you're there and they're like, no, no, human, human, human. So it's, it's this great human that you have to deal with. Um, but still, um, there are certain insights about language and politics and democracy that are very um, uh, enlightening and um, uh, useful for thinking through the relations that we have with others. And uh, what you find in the history of Western philosophy, it's different for other traditions of thought, but I'm mostly, my work is located um, uh, in, in this Western tradition, is that a lot of philosophers um, uh, think that humans are the only beings who have language. Um, humans are the only true political agents. This is also what Sue um, uh, spoke about um, by uh, saying something about the political turn. Um, and um, these things are all also connected. So um, having language is often seen as a kind of a necessary aspect for um, being a uh, political actor. We find that in philosophy, but also in our common political practices, right? It's kind of um, uh, accepted by many societies that a lot of our uh, political uh, engagements are heavily based on a spe very specific, narrowly defined type of uh, language. Um, so, so it's not just philosophy, it's also the, the real world. Philosophy is also the real world. <laughs> I don't want to make this all too extreme. Um, uh, but there are also many other ways of, of uh, doing uh, politics, of course. So um, uh, the question um, of whether or not animals speak is a uh, political question. It's uh, defined by power relations. It comes from the image of a human as possessing language and other animals as not possessing language. Um, and it's very closely related to uh, other political questions, such as questions of democratic participation um, uh, and um, the way we think about political communities and um, uh, a lot of things that we actually take for granted. And um, when I was writing my PhD thesis about uh, um, this kind of entanglement of um, language and politics, um, in which I argue that uh, animals do speak, that they are uh, political agents and that we should form new um, communities with them, not with all of them, but um, uh, at least the ones that uh, we are, um, who, who want to form a community with us. Um, when I was writing this, I actually came across a lot of uh, empirical studies about things that other animals um, uh, say and do, so studies uh, about language. And these are also and that's where the book uh, Animal Languages came out. So that's kind of based more on the, on the, on the language part of, uh, of language. Um, so you were asking about voices um, uh, and what does it mean that animals have voices? What does political voice mean in the case of uh, other animals? I think this starts um, uh, by recognizing that they have their own ways of, um, and they is also already difficult, right? Because then there's a day we, which is problematic, but I'm, I'm also going to use these words as if they, uh, as if we can use them somewhere, what straightforwardly. Um, so other animals have voices, they speak, they have their own perspective uh, on the world, they say things. Um, we've, um, human societies, uh, 
uh, do not take it seriously and in fact actively exclude them from uh, political practices, um, uh, often uh, see them as mute. This is a cultural problem, it's a political problem, it's a social problem, it's um, uh, driven by uh, economic problems, so all of these things are, um, uh, are intertwined. But it's also not because that's something that 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 I was thinking about when uh, Sue and Patrice were speaking. It's also always already there. They are always already um, uh, creating meaning, building communities, uh, engaging with humans, watching humans, studying humans, uh, making jokes sometimes uh, about humans. You know, so um, so there is all of this this engagement. It's not something new that we now have to uh, bring into being. It's something we need to recognize. But what precisely political voice entails is not something that I can answer now as a human being because a we've not listened to animals enough and um, uh, humans don't have a clue we we've oppressed animals for much too long uh, and there's a lot they could say if we would ask them different questions um, uh, but b it's also a multi-species question because otherwise i'm just repeating the loop of anthropocentrism as sue was also saying you're then as a human being again defining okay this is language this is politics you are in way let's go you know but that's not how it works so it's really this process um, uh, that we need to enter much more seriously not just as uh, individuals or as a community but also as societies um, uh, in which we uh, engage in, in serious political dialogues with other animals uh, about issues that uh, concern them and concern us. And um, that should be, be the, the basis of um, really fully yeah, getting to a better understanding of what political voice means. And of course, it won't be one thing because it will mean something very different in the case of a squirrel or a, a dog or um, a, all of these others uh, that we are lucky to share the planet with. Thank you very much for this wonderful response, Eva. Actually, I remember you told me recently, a month ago or so, that you feel that somehow you are first animal and then human. And that's something that I was very surprised by, because it, I think it's the first time I've ever heard that. But hearing how you were raised and so on, I, it begins to make more sense to me. So I'm really glad that you said some of the things you said. It's super interesting. What I wanted to ask now, it's uh, related to the first question as well, because you have argued indeed that animals do speak. But then something that then many people would perhaps question, and I'm thinking here a lot about the people in the law and one of the things that many lawyers say to me is animals cannot write constitutions they cannot be in a court uh, basically they cannot speak they cannot write therefore we need to represent them uh, whatever we need to do the, the question is never whether the animals are going to author uh, democracies and our third world but rather how can we represent their interests yet we here comes questions of listening to animals but again uh, and this is something that you already touched on i think the question is perhaps already mistaken because it's if we kind of center animals the question is not how can we listen to them but how can we listen to ourselves as well because we are animals we're humans and you've written on this extensively and you've practiced this as well uh, in your life and Patrice as well, and Sue. So that's why, why the three of you are here, I suppose. So anyways, could you tell us a little bit about perhaps animal listening, I guess, and trying to reformulate the question in more animal terms? How can we listen in a more animal way as animals, perhaps? I, I think that learning to be attentive and to listen and to um, be attuned more to other animals is um, I, one of the big challenges now for humans, right? And I think a lot of human beings uh, feel this also in the context of uh, climate change, that there's a necessity to decenter the human and to um, uh, um, change our attitude. And changing one's attitude takes practice. It means being aware of the things that you always do that you know are harmful or, or uh, not productive or, uh, or whatever. Um, and it's, um, 
and there's also an element of uh, newness in it. I've, I've um, been writing a bit about Pauline Oliveros, the composer who wrote about deep listening, this is, which is a, a practice of, which is a musical practice. Uh, and she also um, uh, developed certain pieces that she called sonic meditations in which um, humans um, actively listen and for her it's it's uh, something you do with your ears so but i think that for me listening is more it's perhaps a bit broader but she's um uh, writing about listening as a way of determining your standpoint and also um uh, as as a as a practice and a process and and it's something you need to learn so when you actually begin to listen you will always hear a lot more than you were thinking uh, that you were going to hear uh, and it also means that you allow yourself to be changed and transformed and uh, so it's it's really in this kind of self other uh dynamic opening oneself up uh, to the other um that's one of one of the basic things i think but that's more kind of the ethical um, um project of listening and that is something that um i for example try to do or um, also learn to do but also am taught to do uh, by the, the animal companions that I share my life with, um, for example, dogs, but also laboratory mice who have their own ways of um, creating meaning. And they have a lot of practices of care that are uh, moving to watch, and they are actually teaching me a lot about um, life. But it, it's, it's, you know, it's always very fundamental. And also because the mice do not live to be very old, um, uh, the fact that they die, the way in which they take care of their dead companions, um, uh, all of these practices have transformed me in the past uh, year or so. Um, another example is uh, the toad and frog working group that I set up in the town where I live. Um, uh, toads and frogs go into hibernation in winter and then they wake up in uh, March and April and they go to their, their uh, to the ponds where they meet their friends and hang out and do the kind of party stuff they do in spring. Um, but they're very slow. So they can't uh, cross the streets and in the town where I live, I moved here uh, two years ago, I suddenly found out that one evening they were there, they were everybody, everywhere, sitting on the sidewalk, you know, it was this kind of David Lynch movie where suddenly you had to watch out where you would, would um, uh, uh, step and everything. And I was immediately, I was like, oh no, to uh, toads and frogs, I need to help them cross the street because I know that they are slow. I, I just didn't know they were in this town because I moved here in winter. Um, and everybody was kind of accepting it, you know, as if it's a fact of life that they cross the street and the bus runs them over. So I set up this uh, working group with 14 volunteers and it's been a transformative practice for all of us. You know, people have really um, began to see themselves in their own position as humans in this town differently through helping them, through attending to them. You have to watch them to know uh, where they want to go. So it's paying attention to their agency. And the frogs and toads, you know, they don't like us at all. So it's not about that kind of relationship. But it's still a very um, uh, valuable practice when you are thinking about learning to listen to other animals. It's just, you need to do the work. It's like Patrice said, you know, imagination is doing and it's doing it with them. And... Um, that um yeah so so these are a couple of examples and um uh, but what i really think we need but that's also a democratic question that's uh, of great concern in relation to human groups uh, are better political listening um, practices and um i think that for example, in uh, the deliberative theories of democracy, there's a bit of attention for listening, um, but not so much. You know, the focus is still very much on speaking. And when it's about listening, it's about listening as kind of a receptive practice. But listening is not just that, you know, it's also active engagement. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's that's one of the things uh, we need to develop as societies also because uh, political debates at the moment are very uh, not constructive. We do have a good example in the Netherlands, uh, which is the Party for the Animals. They started out as a really marginal, small 
uh, political party that's only focused on animals, but now they have this, this holistic view of uh, the planet, of the other animals, uh, of, uh, including humans uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, and what they do is they decenter the human in, in their message, which is very interesting because they're the only political party that I know that is not there for themselves at all. You know, so it's um, uh, it's really a different way of doing politics, and I find that very interesting. And I think that it's not exactly listening, but there's something else at the core of the um, political practice. It's other directed, and uh, uh, that's a very good example, I think, for how um, existing political practices and also the legal uh, practices that you uh, mention can sometimes be changed uh, from the inside out. Um, but I also think that simply applying uh, or, or, or envisioning animals in uh, political settings is a, is, is a lack of imagination, uh, but that's something that we will discuss later. Yes, again, Eva, what you say speaks to me a lot. I, it's so wonderful to have the three of you here because I just listened to you and you just speak to part of some of the things I thought. Now that we've covered, because we've been stayed for quite a while in this first part, which I'm very glad of because it was all very, very interesting. Uh, we will get into the, as I said before, the second part where we're going to have more of an open conversation um, based on three, three themes or three questions. So the first one is more on what one would I have written here uh, on the nature of the political, as it were. It's a question of uh, animal political agency. Because one thing that I assumed when I thought about the title of our conversation, the idea that animals are political agents, but this is certainly not the assumed by many uh, other people. And I, in my case, my understanding of the political, and I think in your, the case of the three of you as well, is very influenced by feminism. And feminism tells us that many ordinary practices are political in nature. For example, as Sue was mentioning before, people like Alistair Cochrane or Robert Garner or Angie Pepper, uh, they oppose this view. They think that animals are not political agents. So I thought, well, maybe some people do not agree with the terms of the discussion we are having. Uh, they just would think this is just not right. How would you respond to uh, to, to this kind of view? Uh, people who would be skeptical about it. Uh, why do you think basically that some animals' actions are political in nature? That's really the question I'm trying to ask here. I'm happy to jump in on that one and then... Um, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I can say a little bit maybe about a, tr a traditional idea of political agency and then sort of new developments in the ideas of political agency that that I think sort of help us get around some of the, the problem. Um, so I think one of the worries that critics have uh, is about distinguishing. Um, so if, if animals can't tell us when they're being, they can't explicitly tell us when they're being political agents, uh, how do we distinguish political communication uh, or political claims from, uh, from just ordinary everyday activities and private concerns or private actions. Um, so, so what I mean by that is that many of our actions are personal or private uh, in the sense that they don't constitute a claim on others to change the norms of society, to reshape public institutions and practices or alter the distribution uh, of benefits and burdens of collective life or anything like that. Um, but sometimes, of course, we do make such claims. And as I understand political agency, it's about the opportunity to develop and advance such claims uh, concerning collective life, uh, to have them weighed fairly uh, in relation to the claims that others make on the community, uh, and potentially to change the, the arrangements of social life. So, and, and enabling political agency in this way seems to me just, it's essential to, to avoiding tyranny. Um, so, but traditional conceptions of, uh, or at least in traditional political theory, has tended to view political agency as an individual capacity. So this is something that particular individuals do and control. Uh, it's one that requires complex cognitive capacities to formulate specific claims, uh, to identify the, the, the specific individuals or the institutions that have responsibility to, to, to address those claims. Um, and who uh, are, it also demands of the individual that they articulate and justify their claims uh, to others in the language of reasons. So to exercise political judgment, in other words, in very complex ways. 
So this perspective, as I said, locates political agency overwhelmingly uh, within within the individual. Um, so more, more recently, though, uh, democratic theory has shifted in a more uh, systemic direction, recognizing that articulation and evaluation of political claims takes place not just within the minds of discrete individuals, um, but across a range of um, relations and practices uh, in ways that individuals of very different capacities or inclinations or identities uh, can participate in different ways. So individuals can initiate or propose uh, certain new practices relevant to collective life without having worked out claims or plans or justifications. All of this can emerge over time and place depending on the response or, or the uptake um, by others. So, so political judgment uh, can occur at this social level. So, so there's no one way to be a political agent or a responsible citizen uh, in a democracy. Um, and uh, feminist and disability and, and childhood theorists and others, I think have been at the forefront of a, of a shift uh, to what um, the political theorist Sharon Krauss calls a more uh, a diverse relational and distributed uh, conception of political agency. So this is political agency as a social accomplishment, I think we could say, uh, not or not, not just an individual capacity. So, but having said all that, I really want to repeat Ava's caution, which I fully uh, accept. I, I always feel as I start to articulate these things that I'm already probably going down a certain tunnel limited by, you know, um, the thoughts that we could have about something like political agency from this space where we still haven't embarked on this journey uh, with other animals. So, so I say this with a great deal of caution, but, but, I, but I do believe that there are trends uh, in uh, certain kinds of political theory that open up space for at least, at least for us to start down that, um, down that road. Yeah. The thing that I'm I'd struggle with is that okay so and what, what Sue just said is crashing in my head at the same time. Uh, so 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 uh, things um, can be true uh, that we don't um, see, uh, and things can be true that we are not um, able to articulate. Um, and so, like in some ways, I'm I'm troubled by the the very question uh because i mean it's self-evidently the case that among um themselves well one a lot of this is about like animals in relation to us but it's certainly self-evidently the case that that animals among themselves um do all of the things um that we do um and call politics in terms of uh, quite self-evidently social animals solve in some way or another their problems in collective living. Um, they make decisions in some way or another um, about what um, their social groups are, are going to do and how they're gonna conduct themselves and they pass. Uh, so, so, so then what are we talking about? Are we just talking about, well, is what they're doing consistent with the word politics? Um, or, you know, do we have to have a political theory um, that, 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 can in, in, that can acknowledge that in order to call it politics? Like, I guess I'm just worried a little bit about the sort of built-in anthropocentrism of even sort of framing this question in the way it's framed. Um, about, well, what are we doing with the word politics? But then I'm really aware that humans are so prone to fighting over our sound symbols. So I don't really want to get into that. Uh, but I guess that's, so So on the one hand, I, it seems self-evidently true. Yes, animals are doing all the things uh, that we call politics. On the other hand, um, and, and it seems bigotry to not recognize that. Um, and, and in relation to us, it's quite clear that animals are contesting uh, the tyranny in many, 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 many different ways. Um, uh, and so um, to me, the question is more like, uh, is, 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 is whatever political theory is thinking even capable of recognizing reality? 
Yeah, if I may I... very briefly before, because actually I wanted to ask you something, Abe, as well. But just about the potential anthropocentrism of the question, because I think it could be anthropocentric depending how one reads it. One of the things that I actually was going to say, Ava has argued, is that in a very nice article, I can't remember the name, it's from 2013 in Human, Human Animalia, I think, uh, is that we should amplify the spectrum of what, the political, but that we is an animal we. So we animals should do that together. So when I ask the, that question, to, I'm already in my head, I'm assuming a little bit Ava's kind of thinking in that question, because indeed that question for, for some people, the answer, you know, Patrice, to you because you're a very animal person, as it were, it's very clearly, it's self-evident, as you said. Animals, of course, they do all sorts of political actions. And to you, it's very clear. But some, some authors would contest that and be very skeptical about it because they would think, well, only when beings intentionally try to change political institutions, we can talk of really a kind of political agency, or only when the decision is as it were, made by an autonomous, rational individual who, you know, really is kind of thinking this action uh, is political or can't reflect on what the, what the good is in very human-centric sense, right, in a very linguistic sense that one can ask, what is the good, and think about it in those terms. So from that point of view, uh, politics uh, can be anthropocentric, but if we think of how can we redefine the political, uh, we animals, altogether, then I believe it becomes an animal question, really. Um, but anyways, Ava is the one who has argued these things, so maybe she can comment on this or say something else, perhaps, if she, if she, if she would. Yeah, I was going to say something slightly different. Um, uh, I've, I've been reading Wittgenstein's remarks on color. They're not really about color, which is uh, interesting, but it's it's about, about philosophical method. It's not so much about language as the other stuff, but um, uh, I, it's nice to read as a book about philosophical method. Basically, he's, um, as always, saying, what are we talking about when we are talking about something? And why are we talking about it? And what are what's the route that we take? And I I think that I've now heard a couple of different um, uh, answers to the question about animals as political agents that are also directed to um, perhaps a slightly different audience. Um, so yes, animals are of course political agents. We don't see all of it, but we see a lot of it and we have, I guess, a pretty good grasp. Um, uh, we, uh, Patrice is part of multi-species communities in a beneficial way, but there's, there are also all of these other larger political systems that are really, really unjust. Um, uh, but that have a kind of, um, and that's also what Sue and Will, of course, have been writing about, that have a uh, attachment to justice. So that they kind of wanted to become more just. And I think that the, um, the way in which Sue is um, uh, speaking about political agency is kind of connected to that promise of um, political philosophy, which is in fact the promise of actual politics, right? Because that is also political philosophy is also trying to imagine more just actual politics. Um, uh, and that's a kind of very intricate conversation that because it's um, it's a conversation with history and with peers that are not um, uh, seeing the animals and and perhaps also with a larger audience outside of that, including politicians. Um, so that answer to the question of political agents is very um, uh, needs to stay close to the anthropocentric paradigm in order to make sense collectively. Um, but the risk, if we stay too close to that conversation, is that, that, that we move into the anthropocentric paradigm. But the other risk, if, if, if you're going to be completely radical and um, uh, um, animal, <laughs> you also lose the, um, uh, it's, it's, so it's, I, I think that all of us are trying to navigate the kind of difficult, different conversations and maybe the, the queer um, animal liberation also holds a promise in that regard, because I think that A, humans tend to listen more to humans than to other animals and okay, they've listened to LGBTQ plus humans. So there's, there's a bit of a basis for that, for that type of exclusion. But it's also, I think for the people of, of the, who are queer, it's very, um, um, 
easy to understand what it means to be a political agent, even if you're not interested in politics at all, because you're politicized all the time by all the others, just by doing normal stuff, you know? Um, uh, they're making you into some kind of object of power. <clears throat> so I think that, that that's perhaps um, uh, something that, that connects the ties from a, from a different direction. But I do think that... Um, uh, uh, the question of anthropocentrism and what kind of language games we pick to um, un unfold it or to, to address it matters a lot because um, uh, we can't take it for granted. We need to keep, keep discussing it. Uh, and I think that we also need to be... Um, uh, I don't know who the we is precisely that I'm talking to, but kind of the animal philosophers or pro-animal people or those um, engaging with public discourse as well, that, that it's important to think about what kind of um, uh, stories we direct in what um, uh, dimension. And I do think that um, we've not really... Uh, uh, spoken about actual political acts of animals, except that Patrice was saying that, uh, uh, speaking about community building, but that's also uh, perhaps another route of, um, yeah, drawing attention to their perspective. But it's not up to us, but then, yeah, that's also the easy answer, right? We need, <laughs> we need to go into the, we need to go into the, to the hard stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we can't, I, I mean, you need to provide an alternative, I think, as, as, as being done in fine, but also in the work that we write. And so what we'll the book is also an alternative. Still, you need to get your hands dirty in public discourse all the time because you need to have the conversation, I think. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for articulating that, Eva. I mean, it's just the daily struggle, right? How, how much do we enter onto the territory of certain discourses with certain audiences? Um, and and I, as you say, I, th I think it's just a question to just constantly be asking oneself, why am I entering this domain uh, or this language game? What what do I think I can accomplish here? Or um, so that's that's an ongoing struggle for sure. And I find that like I, I am committed to entering some of these difficult domains. Um, and, um, but it, it, yeah, it's, it's fraught, but I, I agree it's, uh, it's necessary as well, yeah. So you see this, Patrice, because you are kind of nodding, but I wonder, what do you think about this? <laughs> I was just enjoying, I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation um, and um, feeling super happy because I already knew Sue, but now I know Ava too, and that's like, uh, we're going to have some more conversations, um, I hope. And um, uh, but I was thinking, like, I, I obviously I wasn't critiquing the question by saying that I worry about um, anthropocentrism. I was, I, I think I was. I'm just glad that all of these things that have been said have 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 been said, um, and I think might lead nicely into the next question you're planning to ask. Indeed, it does. No, I, and I'm very, I'm very glad that you raised this point, uh, Patrice, of anthropocentrism, because even in the way that the question is formulated, depending on how one reads the term political, one can fall very quickly into anthropocentric thinking. So I, I thought it was fantastic that you brought this up, and then we had the chance to Ava and to uh, give these wonderful remarks. Our next question, as Patrice was saying, um, is very related to these last questions we were talking of. And uh, so the, just to give a little bit of context, perhaps, if some people are not very familiar with political philosophy, maybe, one of the dominant assumption, assumptions in political philosophy and in politics more generally as well in the public domain, Eva was referring as well to public discourse, is that political communication is usually equated with human speech. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. And also that political deliberation can only be done through human speech. This has been an assumption for centuries and centuries. But in fields like disability studies, feminism, and other areas, this view has been contested uh, and by emphasizing the role of embodied political communication. And Patrice, I know this is really present in the daily life of the humans at Vine, that they understand that the embodied communication of the non-humans is political. How they are negotiating rules, who can go where and when, 
Uh, all these things are constantly being renegotiated through that embodied communication. My question to the three of you is whether you can explain what that means a little bit more, why animals' embodied communication is political. And also because the three of you have kind of have first-hand experience on this, whether you could give examples of embodied political communication that you might have witnessed and you might have practiced as well, because I think the three of you have probably practiced this. So, yes, those are my questions. Well, I think that we already spoke a bit about this, right, um, uh, in relation to voice and also in relation to uh, political agency. And um, one of the things that um, is very soon clear when you are thinking about um, animals and having political conversations with them, discussing issues that arise in multi-species communities, simply living your life with companion animals, um, is that there's a huge range of ways in which um, you can negotiate things or simply discuss them or uh, cooperate, um, uh, including uh, uh, the, the sounds, uh, uh, sense, but also things like habits, uh, creating understanding about things through creating uh, common habits. Um, and um, when you think about the political communication or deliberation with other animals, um, uh, many of these things can play a role. And um, we've been speaking about having conversations uh, with animals. Uh, some of these conversations are political or deal with uh, political issues, and um, they can for be deliberative practices or they can be seen as uh, deliberative practices. Traditionally in uh, political philosophy, deliberation has, as Sue uh, uh, already explained in relation to political agency, been defined quite narrowly as a sort of um, uh, rational capacity of the human to express themselves in a, a specific kind of human language, very close to the language that we are using now, in fact, <laughs> to speak to each other uh, through the internet. And um, so we're not having, I mean, we're having a kind of embodied, strangely embodied conversation in which we use our heads and hands and shoulders uh, and voices. Um, uh, but in political philosophy, uh, deliberation has been defined quite humanly and uh, rationally and narrowly. And yeah, rationally is a bit of a difficult word because animals are rational too in their own ways, uh, but in, in terms of human rationality uh, at least. Um, but already in relation to um, uh, human groups, that view has been contested uh, by uh, feminist uh, uh, theorists, decolonial uh, scholars, uh, arguing that specific modes of communication that were long seen as kind of the standard uh, way of having uh, uh, political uh, deliberations uh, were in fact formed by power relations and benefited uh, certain groups, um, uh, specifically the groups that were already in power. So that kind of work has been done in uh, human deliberation. And basically that opens up the way um, uh, to thinking about animal deliberation as well, um, not simply in the sense of ex including other animals, but also thinking about it uh, as, a, as an animal um, uh, practice. Now, Sue has uh, written uh, a wonderful article uh, showing how this can be the, the, the developed further uh, in practice, but before we can go, and I think Patrice is doing it, right, in fine, but before we turn to these more specific uh, uh, examples, maybe it's it's good to say something about the laboratory mice. I mean, the, e the easy um, example in my case would perhaps be my uh, communications with my dog companion, Oli, uh, who uh, was a Romanian stray dog, but uh, came to live with me. Uh, we were very fortunate to find each other uh, and um, we we had to learn a lot both of us and we were willing both of us also to learn uh, uh, but a lot of it a lot of these engagements were political he had to walk on the leash because it's it's you need to do it here and this restricted him uh, and we kind of on a very micro level on the level of this this one very small um, uh, unit uh, we uh, we had these ongoing uh, 
um, uh, discussions that, that were definitely uh, political in nature. Also, if you would ask him, uh, and Oli's a good, he's a, he's a good uh, citizen, he's a better citizen than I am. He's a cosmopolitan and he's very, or yeah, he's very uh, polite to, uh, to everybody, but uh, we needed some... Um, some communication but what's also interesting is that i now live with laboratory mice as i mentioned and um, our process of getting to know each other and um, has also been um, uh, in the form of having these type of embodied dialogues uh, that involved objects like the running wheels but also different houses that i put in their um, uh, larger mouse house um, uh, interactions. They really um, disliked me strongly uh, in the beginning. They, they showed disgust really on their faces when they smelled my hand, but they did like my voice. So I play music for them, ukulele and guitar, and I sing to them. Uh, they like that. They um, also like, like it when I play the piano. They are now quite old and they've become, um, uh, I don't know if they like me. They do like me for climbing on, on but they walk uh, uh, in the room and um, uh, we, we have a different kind of uh, relationship. And I think that, um, I mean, a lot of it is negotiations around space, um, uh, the creation of common habits, um, the question of freedom, because they do, uh, and, and uh, sort of making your own decisions regarding your own life. And I've, I've had to, learn to pay attention to them, learn about their their ways of being, and they learned about me. And all of that is restricted by the captivity that I enforce on them. And um, that's problematic. And I find it hard. I mean, there's no way around it. Eh? They, so they, I, I enlarge their space as much as possible. And enlarging the space is not simply the space. It's also really the space, right? Because space matters when you want to make your own decisions. But it's also, I think, the symbolic space of um, being able to make as many decisions uh, that you can. So it's been, I don't know, it's it's the conversations have been have been difficult, but also enriching. And I, of course, their lives could be much better. But still, it's uh, um, a lot happened in the past two years. So it's. Uh, for them as well so i uh, and what is but i'm going on too long sorry um but what is interesting about the fact that um their community also has grown a lot you know because they had no examples they were just it was just the 10 of them in a box a very small box they've been in that box for half a year so they've had to learn everything you know that in their um uh, for example when someone dies they had to learn what the meaning of death is and what you do when someone dies and that took some deaths before they realized okay this is this is what goes on and their friendships grew and their uh some of them changed as they as they got older that is one half of the or half I, i'm not sure it's it's one part of the deliberation and then there's also the question of how we translate uh these uh on-site uh, direct democracy type um deliberations to existing uh, political practices in the transition to um, uh, more just uh, systems, uh, but I've been speaking for too long, so now somebody else should speak. Oh, well, that's our next question, Ava, remember? Okay, sure. <laughs> later. I don't have a lot to say. I'm really, I'm really interested in, in listening here. I guess I just wanna, one of the things I wanted to say, Ava started to uh, set a bit, which is just to remember that all of our communication is embodied. Just because it feels like speech is something separate from our bodies, it's in fact um, something done by, you know, quite, we could even identify what parts of our bodies are involved in producing speech and, and gestures, et cetera. And so I, I don't want us to um, make uh, the uh, error of, of, of thinking that somehow uh, human language is not embodied communication. Um, it's, it's, it's done by our bodies. Uh, it's just a particular thing done by a particular kind of ape body. Um, and, you know, there's no particular reason, obviously, to privilege uh, that. Uh, although it's very helpful uh, for us and, and undoubtedly has enabled us to, to do some of the wonderful and dreadful things that we've done. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking is that 
or at least I was just remembering uh, how much negotiation or or what might be considered political speech is going on um, or always already there, as as Ava said earlier. Um, you know, right now at uh, in the trees around my house, various birds of different species and squirrels of different species are negotiating the shared space of the willow tree um, at, you know, some watering hole or another. Multiple species are, you know, not only engaging in within species communication with each other about their own social group, but engaging in some sorts of international relations. Um, and negotiations around um, how we're going to share uh, this resource. Um, and so, you know, all of these things, again, are just, are, are, are always happening and, and it's, it's only bigotry um, that uh, prevents us from seeing it, but not only bigotry, also, and now I'm slipping into the next question, I think, but, but I, I think it's important to remember that um, Listening is also something we do with our bodies, um, our eyes and ears, um, and they have particular um, physiological um, setups. I was thinking this also when Ava mentioned Wittgenstein and, and, and color. Um, and what flashed into my head was uh, some fairly recent study of uh, the communication of some particular bird, which I've forgotten now. Um, and, and the humans have finally figured out that what they thought was nonsense um, is actually quite complex patterns. And it's just that it was so fast um, that our ears couldn't perceive it. And the only way we have figured out the patterns is by, by actually slowing it down. Um, and so, so it's not just speech that's embodied on our behalf, but listening and our own bodies, you know, make certain kinds of listening possible, but they also make certain kinds of listening um, difficult. Um, and that's true for other animals as well. And so that's another thing that we have to negotiate is the, the physical differences. Um, but that doesn't make it impossible as disability rights um, would, would tell us just because folks um, are, are, are communicating um, using different kinds of languages uh, doesn't mean that we can't find some way. Uh, to, to, to do, do the negotiations, as non-human animals demonstrate every day. Uh, no, but also in relation to these different ways of, um, uh, uh, I mean, even amongst humans, we have so many ways of generating meaning, you know, a poem or a song or a piece of music without words will reach you in a very different way or touching someone or looking them in the eyes, you know, I'm always... It's also with humans, it's just as complex, you know, it's always like, oh, humans are easy and then the other animals are, are, are sort of difficult, but it's all, it all has its own complexities, but also promises in that sense. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, this is, um, I think it's so important to not, uh, for people not to have the sense that it's, it's, it's not that it's not very complicated uh, and isn't going to take a lot of work for us to engage in a new politics with animals, but it's not that it's, um, yeah, a radically different kind of thing than in the, in the human politics case. I mean, human political agency and political judgment, these are uh, intensely interpretive and judging um, processes. They aren't, you know, it's not just this transparent thing where people um, uh, express a political claim or a political concern, and and we all understand it or uh, or accept it or or judge it on the basis of argumentation. We don't. We're engaged in this much more profound um, and. Uh, complicated process of, yeah. of evaluating. But then also you sometimes meet someone new and you think, oh, that's it. So. Mm -hmm. And before we move to the next question, any other thing that you might wish to say about, you know, uh, embodied political communication? Do you have any other thought? I mean, just that, 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 that it's important that we also do political communication, not in words. Right. I mean, there are sit-ins and um, uh, um, uprisings um, and violence and all sorts of, of, of political speech. 
um, that isn't speech. Yeah, and even silence, what is usually considered to be silence. I just wrote a little book in Dutch about the many different forms of political <clears throat> silence that are there, that are sometimes straightforwardly refusal or protest um, or ignoring or people are silenced, but there are many interconnections uh, there as well um, in the human case and also the animal case, because they also sometimes choose to ignore us, of course. The last question of today, it's actually not my question, it's a question that I heard so uttering in an interview with uh, Claudia Hirtenfelder, who conducted the interview in the Animal Farm podcast. And Sue said that, um, the following, she said, how do we move from animals experience and shared experiencing and they start to translate that into more systemic terms, more communal terms? And uh, Sue also said, uh, that's the real challenge of animal politics and doing democracy with animals. So what I wanted to ask you all, how do we translate animals' experiences, experiences and what they say into institutional mechanisms that can enable non-humans to shape our political and legal systems? And I also wanted to direct a little bit this question to all of you, but also Patrice, I wanted to mention at Vine, the non-human residents, and we've touched on this before, author Vine's politics and the rules of interactions and so on. And I believe that we can learn a lot here about how can we then translate that into more perhaps in, in a more institutional sense, because as it, Vine is an institution also, I was thinking uh, earlier. So perhaps you can tell us about how do you do this at Vine? Um, yeah, so I'm happy to jump in on this. So I've said a little bit about this already, I guess, in relation to the Agora. Um, for, but more generally on, on the question of the scale of politics, I guess, um, I think we need to think of politics as unfolding at multiple scales, in nested political communities, um, and in the spaces and places that are meaningful for different kinds of political actors or different kinds of political move, uh, communities. Um, and so this could be family and communal living and work settings, it could be neighborhoods, it could be cities. Um, and as I've said, I think that it is face-to-face -face spaces and scales that best allow for animals to participate directly in politics with humans. Um, of course, in their own uh, political communities that the, the scales work very differently. Um, but I'm thinking here specifically of of their uh, of human and animal relations uh, and scales of politics. So, so, so that I guess the first thing I would say um, is uh, that we need to actually devolve power largely, devolve power down uh, in many ways to these face-to-face -face scales and um, locations where I think animals can actually participate in meaningful ways. Um, but when it comes to these large scale and international questions of politics and so on, um, we, we obviously need different tools, especially in the context of urgent climate uh, and biodiversity crises, uh, which are obviously utterly devastating wild animal communities. Um, so I think there are two related recent developments uh, that are promising. And one of those is the rights of nature movement and the institutionalization of political representation for rivers and ecosystems uh, and so on. Because I think legal representation and protection for ecologies can serve as a proxy for securing the conditions of self-determination for uh, vast numbers of wild animal communities uh, who depend on those ecologies, obviously, and whose cultural resilience and therefore their ability to do politics is tied to particular places and habitats. Um, so that's one trend, I think, uh, that has promise for supporting uh, wild animal cultures and politics uh, in situ. Um, another hopeful development, I think, is the growing strength of Indigenous resurgence. Um, indigenous political theory offers some very different ways of conceiving relations between sovereign or self-determining human and, and non-human peoples uh, and the land. Um, 
In some indigenous traditions, for example, human relations with wild animals are conceived in terms of uh, a treaty relationship. Um, so that's that's one kind of way of thinking about how we structure these, these uh, political relationships. Um, obviously, this has huge uh, ramifications. So it, it requires like not just questioning Western ideas of, of land and animals as, as property and as resources, but of finding uh, alternative imaginaries based in you know, reciprocity, gift giving, uh, co-stewardship, um, and other ideas that place right relations with the land uh, at the center of, of political legitimacy and, and justice between peoples. So to me, I guess those are two, especially in, in, in thinking of sort of these larger scale um, negotiations that we have to do about uh, sharing the planet. Um, these are two trends that I'm very interested in and, and, and just ho have some, some hope about in a basically hopeless situation. Well, speaking of hopeless situations, I'm here in the United States um, where um, democracy is collapsing as we speak. Um, and, um, and I was just thinking but now, as, as Sue was speaking, and earlier when you were speaking about scale, Sue, um, when I'm thinking about politics among humans here in this particular place, then I'm definitely thinking about um, scale and 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 the absolute essentialness of of somehow um, re communities have collapsed, consensus reality has collapsed, um, and then the need for face-to-face -face communications, uh, dialogue, et cetera, as a way to, like, in the, just to, to rudimentarily build back. And I hadn't really thought, well, maybe this is, you know, one of those opportunities in crisis. Um, you know, if we're going to have to rebuild democracy all over again in the United States, which we will, you know, why not uh, try and, and um, uh, make it more uh, when, when, when initiating those kinds of conversations, uh, uh, try, trying to, to bring um, the larger than human world, you know, in. Um, However, it is possible in 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 this sense. So so um, thank you. I'm going to really think about how to put that in practice in our in a, in our local in our local work. No, don't you? I mean, you already do that so profoundly. It seems to me, Patrice, the way that Vine reaches out to the uh, you know thinks of it very much as part of a local Springfield community, part of a Vermont community, and that so much of your work is actually about that sort of deeply grounded and, and, and sort of multidimensional politics. So, you know, uh, I mean, I guess what I'm thinking more about is like, you know, as you know, there's various things I'm thinking about as an animal advocate, and then there's various things that I'm thinking about, um, you know, as, you know, a citizen of, you know, this particular um, nation state um, at this particular point in time. Um, and in this particularly absurd point in time and um and I guess having this conversation with you all is reminding me that you know that some of the things that that you know I often will do in my oh I don't know when I'm invited to give talks as an eco-feminist you know is is uh you know I, I ask everybody to take a deep breath and then think about that the fact that they, they just breathed in the exhalations of trees and other things to mindfully become aware, to, to, to become more mindfully aware of the communities underground and the communities in the water, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not sure that I do that as much as I could when I'm like at a library trustee board meeting. Um, so now I'm thinking, okay, well, did, did you know I'm an elected official? Yeah, 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 yeah. The chair of the library board of trustees. So, you know, it just seems to me that in the kinds of things that either I do as an individual or that Vine does, um, uh, maybe we're, we've been really clear that we need to bring um, people into conversation with each other again 
Um, just, you know, in the very basic way of we've got to reestablish consensus reality and figure out how to talk to each other. Uh, and so in, in having this conversation, I'm realizing, wait, maybe this is an opportunity to be more mindful about saying those kinds of things um, while at those kinds of meetings, if that makes sense. Also, Patrice, because I was asking you how the animals kind of author the institution of Vine, I believe that one of the things that happens at Vine is that, for instance, it's not like there's not a lot of kind of Vine tourism, as it were. You don't have a lot of humans coming around because it is understood that that's the commons is the animals, the non-humans home, as it were. So there is as well kind of education programs and other things, but I believe that I'm, I'm, if you could say a little bit more, because I'm very interested in this, and I believe people listening to us are probably very interested in this. How are the non-humans shaping Vine and Vine's practices, how Vine is, uh, who Vine allows in or not and when, uh, what practices can happen there because the non-humans are telling you what they want, basically, and you're respecting that and putting that at the center. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit about that, maybe? Somehow I lost your I lost your question. I mean, certainly as we're making, um, I mean, certainly we we try to obviously listen, uh, look, perceive, you know, things that are said to us directly. Uh, but at other times we have to think, well, what would they like? What would this person or that person or this collectivity, you know, like us to do? And so then that's a process of, um, you know, a complicated cognitive process of empathy and imagination and etc. Um, and then thinking about how there's ways that, you know, for the present and probably always, th there are ways that we'll have to just represent, um, be the unelected representatives of the cows in the back pasture, um, who absolutely, you know, do know exactly what um, humans are capable of. Um, or at least some of them do, um, but but have no way to understand our political structures or or what choices I might have to make on their behalf about that. And there's not really a way to directly ask about those kinds of, of questions. Um, uh, so, but it, it, this was one thing I wanted to make sure I said, which is that there's a diversity of viewpoints among non-human animals. Um, and I'm not just talking about how, you know, different things are important to frogs, um, than, are, than are important to bears. Uh, but um, even among, you know, within the same species, within the same community, there are people who, um, you know, have different viewpoints. And so I think of the cows in the back pasture, and I think, you know, for the most part, cows are super generous people um, who are really quite troubled when they see others suffering. And so I feel, you know, fairly certain, you know, that, that they would want me to sort of err on the side of kindness, generally, um, and sociability. But then I know that, like, there's Jan. And, I mean, Jan would fuck a motherfucker up um, if, if, if she had the opportunity uh, to do what she wanted to do to humans. And so I have to take that into account, too, right? I can't uh, so it's it's not an easy uh, thing uh, 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 to do. And those are just the things that come to my mind. Yeah, just very briefly about the diversity of viewpoints. So I live with two Romanian strays and Doris is really a very strict communitarian. Nobody is still allowed in our house. And we've negotiated this for a long time. And I think I sort of gave up. Uh, I mean, people, dogs and humans are and others are allowed, but she needs to really get to know them. And Oli is the opposite. You know, he's really polite, very gentle, uh, very careful about things. So, yeah. That's a dog is not a dog, you know, and these these weird dogs and this weird human are we are not humans or dogs, we're just beings. Um, uh, so, so, I mean, a lot has been said. I, I think that uh, Sue very um, uh, pointed to a, a couple of very important um, uh, trends and also um, uh, to the importance of um, connecting the, the local deliberations to um, uh, existing uh, structures, perhaps, of representation uh, and, and other uh, um, things. And uh, Patrice was saying, was actually, I, I found your answer to this question quite hopeful in a sense, uh, um, uh, because 
within the ruins, there are also opportunities for doing it differently. And um, what I was also thinking is that a lot of it is, uh, there's a lot of translation involved uh, between different fields. And I always feel that we cannot, sometimes there's this, um, almost this struggle over what route should we take or what is most effective or what is most, I don't know, just or something, but we need everything. We need work from different directions. And uh, so we need to translate the insights that we have from our work to uh, a general audience, to political institutions. I'm lucky with the party for the animals that I'm in touch with and that I can, you know, give talks for and we, we can discuss things. Um, uh, but also legal structures uh, are informed uh, by things. Art plays a role, um, I think, in imagining new futures and also sort of taking humans out of their fixed um, systems in, in in a sense and uh but other things as well architecture um sharing the land differently understanding that we think that the land is ours but the geese also think it's theirs you know that's you know they they have their their opinions uh, about this um so yeah thinking about translation how to translate uh animal insights um uh, even uh, as as patrice was saying uh it, in daily decisions about their welfare or a shared space, which is necessary. We are tied to this reality. And I think that during our lifetime, we will be tied to a similar uh, reality. We can't hope for the multi-species uh, revolution, although we will and <laughs> we will work towards it. But uh, but still, yeah, there's there's even within the structures, there's there's movement. And that's the last thing that I would want to say is that I think we should uh, practice hope. That's, that's what Ernst Bloch says. Um, as a political practice, we need to imagine better futures and work towards them collectively. So hope is not something coincidental that we might feel and think, oh, wonderful, I'm hopeful about this. And let's leave it at that. No, it's hard work. And it's something that we need to discuss with each other. And maybe that's also something that we've been doing uh, a little bit here today is uh, um, discussing how, how, how it can be done differently and acknowledging that uh, our own perspective is only one amongst many, you know, all the others are already, many others are already doing it differently. Uh, the other animals, but perhaps also certain human traditions. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's my hope for the animal movement, I think as well, that we continue this work and uh, yeah, sort of work together in these different directions. And uh, uh, I mean, the animals, already do it so we can always listen to them if we're uh, unsure about what we have to do that's not a wonderful uh, ending i think i'd like to say something else but i think it's a very nice place to close our conversation today fantastic after every conversation i always uh, read a quote so today's quote i'm going to make an exception generally speaking i i never um, quote someone who is participating in the conversation by today. I thought it was very convenient and appropriate to read a quote from the article I mentioned before, Animal Agents in Community, a Political Multispecies Ethnography of Pine Sanctuary, uh, which was written by Charlotte Plavna, Sue Donaldson, and Ryan Wilco. The quote reads as follows. It says, when exploring questions of interspecies justice, we must acknowledge that it is not ours or not exclusively ours to provide answers or indeed questions. Neither are we the spokespeople of animals, nor are we their saviors. And Sato uh, Platna, Su and Ryan Wilcox, they are citing Vine here. And they say to end, animals are the true teachers and leaders of a movement for interspecies justice. So I think that it captured very well many of the things we've uh, discussed today. I really like the, the quote as well because it's referring to Vine explicitly, it's cited there. Um, so I thought it was a very good uh, way to close this conversation, to think that we are not the spokespeople of animals, we are not their saviors, uh, they are the ones who are teaching us, they are the ones who are leading us and who should lead the movement uh, towards an interspecies democracy, perhaps, like Eva's, and when I must speak, this title uh, reads like that. So anyways, Thank you very much again, Sue, Ava, and Patrice for being 
uh, today here. And I wanted to give a very special uh, thanks to Patrice because I had the opportunity to be at Pine recently. And then all the humans and the non-humans, you were all amazing. And the work you do is absolutely extraordinary there. So thank you very much for that too, to you and all the, non- the humans uh, at Vine and all the non-humans for being so welcoming. Uh, it's been fantastic, this conversation. I'm super happy. And thank you very much again. I hope we talk soon. Bye. Thank you all so much. Hey, buddy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>